Pinar Toprak uh, composed the score for HBO for the HBO documentary McMillions that detailed how the FBI discovered that the McDonald's Monopoly game was rigged. She recently earned her first Emmy nomination for the score. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and Pinar joins us today. And the first question I want to ask you is, have you ever done a score before that has so many different moods and aspects to it? Because in terms of like the tone of the documentary, it's all over the place, but in a, in a good way. And I'm, I'm wondering, had you ever done a score like that before? Every story, there are some moments where, you know, um, you, you have the light and dark and you have the different moods and you have to shape the story along with it. But this particular documentary, certainly there's so many characters and so many different moods. Um, it just gave, uh, it was just a wonderful open canvas to all these different kinds of genres and, and, and styles of writing. And um, there's lots of comedy, there's mystery, there's drama, there's heart and emotion and, and loss and pain and heartache. And it just, uh, it, was, it was really, really fun to write. And I'm... I'm curious, you know, was there any uh, specific part of the score that you uh, found yourself to be particularly proud of? Like, I, I'm because I'm I'm sure the whole score for you is is something to be proud of. But is there any part, a specific part of it that you're just like, yeah, I really got that right? Um, I I, I think James, Brian, and I, we when we when we talked about the score, um, we I feel like I do I. I can't really pick one. Uh, I really like the main title. <laughs> that, that part, I really, really like we nailed. Um, and the rest of the score, I just, I like how it evolved and how it kind of unfolded over time and all the fun moments, for sure. We have a lot of comedic, really, really, really fun moments. Those were really, really wonderful to write. Um, just the entire series was, was a joy to write. I can't pick one. <laughs> What I also found, you know, kind of fascinating, and you, you were telling this to me before we started recording, is that, you know, you, you were discovering, you were seeing this uh, kind of in the same way like you were an audience, like you were a viewer, you know, you were, dis you were discovering all of this, you know, as you saw the episodes. Right. And I'm curious as to whether or not, you know, it, uh, where uh, you saw something happen uh, further along that made you rethink how you uh, had originally uh, 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 done the composition for another scene in another part of the, uh, uh, did it make you rethink how, uh, how you might want to uh, do that score? Not really. I think one of the things that I, I really wanted to do was to make sure I don't, uh, I mean, thematically there is some stuff that, that were hinted and whatnot and, and uh, just along the way, but it was really important for me not to reveal a lot with the music either and just really support the story as, it unfolded for the audience as well. So it was, I wanted to make sure, I, I didn't want to give away anything too early, uh, imply anything other than just some subliminal messages. <laughs> so uh, I did ask you about if there was a part of the score that you were particularly proud of, uh, but I'm curious though, also, was there any part of the, the documentary that you found it very difficult to get the right music for? Not really. I mean, it was it was the whole story and everything was sh shot and edited so beautifully. It just it was really um, well done. So it didn't really feel like um, once we figured out the overall sound palette that we were going with, uh, kind of in initially cracking the code, <laughs> as I say, uh, once we found that it just it just kind of unraveled pretty smoothly. I've often found with um, a lot of composers that a lot of times they there will be specific instruments that they'll find themselves going back to to use for certain characters or moods. Were there any specific uh, instruments that you found yourself going back to uh, to use for certain characters? Uh, there was a lot of sound design involved in this score, so there's definitely a, a, a I mean, there's some kind of funky Ocean's eleven -y stuff that was happening for sure um, that, that I went back to quite a bit. And then there was also a lot of, um, like I said, very kind of subdued, just you know, more sound design sort of stuff. So um, I definitely, um, I was given a lot of freedom, which was wonderful to kind of create the sounds that I, uh, that I wanted and lots of layering. Um, so just a lot of sound molding. 
Uh, was there a particular uh, character or uh, scene that you particularly uh, not pr but enjoyed uh, really composing uh, uh, the music for? Doug, Doug is just. <laughs> I mean, I, wa I could watch Doug for hours, just, <laughs> we, should, we should make a movie just or a show just with him. And I'll watch it for seasons and seasons. He's, he's wonderful, very colorful. So you've done a lot of scores in addition to uh, uh, films. You've done uh, quite a few scores to video games as well. And I'm, uh, what I was wondering is, do you prefer one medium over the other? And also, what are some of the differences you might encounter that other people may not be familiar with when, uh, between the two mediums? Um, I love, I kind of have a musical ADD, as I call it. I love doing different things uh, and different mediums and different styles, different genres, different instrumentations. Um, video games, I've been a huge video game fan from, I'm a kid of the 80s, so I always I used to play a lot of video games. So I um, I love writing for it, and the technicalities are a bit different in terms of how you how you deliver things and how you think. It's different, you know, when you're writing a linear show or a film, you know, where something begins and ends with a video game, other than the cinematics and whatnot. You have to write music that is loopable. And that can change with the with gameplay, so it can get more intense and you know less intense. So I I write music that can go in either direction, and then I deliver different food groups, so to say. And the programmers, which is just the part that I don't understand, and they, I have so much respect for, um, they program my music with the gameplay that can go in either direction. Which that part I don't do. I just write the music part, but uh, but. It, I think thinking like that, you know, writing music that could go in either way, um, that, that's the tricky part. Whereas with, with a film or a TV show, you know where your beginning and end is and what story you're going to tell in those few minutes. Uh, so uh, you're the, you, uh, you got nominated for the Emmy. Uh, you're nominated specifically for the first episode of McMillions, uh, which again, just that episode alone has so many moods and, and and uh, even with the limited characters that they have there, has is you know has you know goes all over the chart. Um, why did you choose episode one to submit for Emmy consideration? Um, well, it was it was a joint choice. Um, that's where we introduce everything, <laughs> all the characters, most things. Um, and so for me, that was the special one. Um, musically, it has a lot of colors. Um, and it showcases different styles of moods, and um, so we, we felt that that would be the appropriate one. So uh, I, you actually brought up the um, uh, the, the 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 main title theme uh, for the for the for the series, which is is so I, I it's it just communicates everything to me so so wonderfully. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, what goes, what, what, how, what's your thought process, you know, when you, when you see that footage and you're like, okay, how am I going to prepare a score for this? How, what goes into thinking about that? Um, they sent, because I wrote the music without really seeing what the main title was going to look like. Um, I only had some, some images that they had sent me and they talked about, James and Brian talked about, um, Beatles a day in the life and untouchables and you know just uh, in terms of some some style direction and I don't know it was just actually it was the first pass the first pass of the main title ended up being the main title so it was like a, the, the first inspiration instinct once I knew what the what the story was and uh, I actually wrote the main title a little after I started writing the score so I knew a bit more about it um, yeah, it's it's got it's so much so much fun. It's got all the high stuff and mystery, and uh, but you also know the you hear the quirkiness and all these all these different characters, and uh, so it was important for me to create something unique that would capture hopefully um, what a crazy story this is. <laughs> Well, I mean, to the to to the craziness of this story, I just got, I'm. Uh, did you uh, do you remember playing the McDonald's Monopoly game, and did it like just and did it blow your mind to you know see that this whole thing had been rigged? It was on this grand you know national scale. Um, I knew about the Monopoly. I moved to America when I was in '97. I was everywhere, but um, and I 
actually survived on McDonald's food for a long time. I never really played, I, I just don't play lotteries or games, you know, I think I just generally think I'm going to lose it anyway, <laughs> so I don't know, I never really played it, um, but I, I was aware of it. I didn't know about the case. For some reason, I just, I, I don't know what was going on with my life back then, but I, I had no idea uh, that any of this had happened, so it was a big surprise. So we uh, uh, mentioned that, you know, you got your first Emmy nomination for this, and congratulations on that. Uh, what was that like when you, uh, when you found out that you'd actually uh, got nominated? So funny enough, I, you know, these days, every day blurs into the next day. We don't, um, and I worked really late the night prior to the nominations announcement. I didn't know when the day was. I knew, I think, like it was going to be that week. Sometime I just genuinely forgotten, and I was working really late the night before, so I slept in, um, and then I woke up. To the, you know, I looked at my phone, I don't sleep with my phone in my bedroom. So I just go over to get my coffee, all sleepy, and I look at my phone, it's like off the chart. So so many messages and voicemails, and I'm like, oh my God, something awful must have happened. <laughs> I'm thinking some natural disaster, or some, some awful thing must have happened. And then I look, oh, okay, thank God. <laughs> it's nothing bad. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. I mean, I think that's what, how everybody would feel. It was just a really beautiful surprise to be, I think it's, it's a great thing to be recognized for the work you do, um, no matter what it is. So it's, it's a huge honor to, to get this um, nomination alongside people that I really admire. And um, yeah, I've been, I, this is it's actually I have this like vision board of things that I want in life, right? And the Emmy is on my vision board, funny enough. <laughs> I, I can't blame you on that one because it is a very beautiful thing to have. So I cannot uh I cannot fault you for that at all. Um <laughs> uh uh well Pinar, thank you so much for talking with us. We wish you all the best at the upcoming Creative Arts Awards. And to our viewers, please like this video, subscribe to the channel in order to get all our latest content, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much.